Chapter 15. The Herman W. Block Memorial Library's air conditioning unit didn't work very well, and there was only one fan. And from the minute me and when Dixie got in the library, he hogged it all. He lay right in front of it and wagged his tail and let it blow his fur all around. Some of his fur was pretty loose and blew right off of him like a dandelion puff. I worried about him hogging the fan and I worried about the fan blowing him bald. But Miss Franny said not to worry about either thing. That when Dixie could hog the fan if he wanted and he had never in her life seen a dog made bald by a fan. Sometimes when Miss Franny was telling a story, she would have a fit. There was little small fits and they didn't last long. But what happened was she would forget what she was saying. She would just stop and start to shake a little like a leaf. And when, she, and when that happened, when Dixie would get up from the fan and sit right at Miss Franny Block's side, he would sit up tall, protecting her, with his ears standing straight up on his head like soldiers. And when Miss Franny stopped shaking and started walking again and talking again, when Dixie would lick her hand and lie back down in front of the fan. Whenever Miss Franny had one of her fits, it reminded me of when Dixie in the thunderstorm. There were a lot of thunderstorms that summer and I got real good at holding on to when Dixie whenever they came. I held on to him and com comforted him and whispered to him and rocked him just the same way he tried to comfort Miss Franny when she had her fits. Only I held on to when Dixie for another reason too. I held on to him tight so he wouldn't run away. It all made me think about Gloria Dump. I wondered who comforted her when she heard those bottles knocking together, those ghosts chattering about the things she had done wrong. I wanted to comfort Gloria Dump, and I decided that the best way to do that would be to read her a book. Read it to her loud enough to keep the ghosts away. And so I asked Miss Franny, I said, Miss Franny, I've got a grown up friend whose eyes are going, going on her and I would like to read her a book out loud. Do you have any suggestions? Suggestions, Miss Franny said. Yes, ma'am, I have suggestions. Of course I have suggestions. How about Gone with the Wind? What's that about? I asked her. Why, said Miss Franny, it's a wonderful story about the Civil War. The Civil War, I said. Do not tell me you have never heard of the Civil War. Miss Franny Block looked like she was going to faint. She waved her hands in front of her face. I know about the Civil War, I told her. That was the war between the South and the North over slavery. Slavery, yes, said Miss Franny. It was also about states' rights and money. It was a terrible war. My great-grandfather fought in that war. He was just a boy. Your great-grandfather? Yes, ma'am. Litmus W. Block. Now there's a story. When Dixie yawned real big and lay down on his side with a thump and a sigh. I swear he knew that phrase. Now there's a story. And he knew it meant we we're going to ha we weren't going anywhere real soon. Go ahead and tell it to me, Miss Franny, I said, and I sat down cross legged next to Win Dixie. I pushed him and tried to get him to share the fan, but he pretended he was asleep and he wouldn't move. I was all settled in and ready for a good story when the door banged and pinch-faced Amanda Wilkinson came in. When Dixie sat up and stared at her, he tried out a smile on her, but she didn't smile back. And so he lay back down. 
I'm ready for another book, Amanda said, slamming her book down on Miss Franny's desk. Well, said Miss Franny, maybe you wouldn't mind waiting. I am telling India Opal a story about my great grandfather. And you, of course, more than welcome to listen to be, it will be just one minute. Amanda sighed a real big dramatic sigh and stared past me. <sighs> she pretended like she wasn't interested, but she was, I could tell. Come sit over here, said Miss Franny. I'll stand, thank you, said Amanda. Suit yourself, Miss Franny shrugged. Now, where was I? Oh yes, Litmus, Litmus W. Block. Chapter 16. Litmus W. Block was just a boy when the firing on Fort Sumter occurred, Miss Franny Block said as she started in on her story. Fort Sumter, I asked. It was the firing on Fort Sumter that started the war, said Amanda. Okay, I said, I shrugged. Well, Litmus was 14 years old. He was strong and big, but he was still just a boy. His daddy, Artley W. Block, had already enlisted, and Litmus told his mama that he was, he could not stand by and let the South get beat. And so he went to fight too. Miss Franny looked around the library and then she whispered, men and boys always want to fight. They are always looking for a reason to go to war. It is the saddest thing. They have this abiding notion that war is fun and no history lesson will convince them differently. Anyway, Litmus went and enlisted. He lied about his age. Yes, ma'am. Like I said, he was a big boy and the army took him and Litmus went off to war just like that. Left behind his mother and his three sisters, he went off to be a hero. But he soon found out the truth. Miss Franny closed her eyes and shook her head. What truth? I asked her. Why, that war is hell. Miss Franny said that with her eyes closed, pure hell. Hell is a cuss word, said Amanda. I stole a look at her. Her face was all pinched up and even more than usual. War, said Miss Franny with her eyes still closed, should be a cuss word too. She shook her head and opened her eyes. She pointed at me and then she pointed at Amanda. You, neither of you can imagine. No ma'am, Amanda and me said exactly at the same time. We looked real quick at each other and then back at Miss Franny. You cannot imagine Litmus was hungry all the time and he was covered with all manner of vermin, fleas and lice. And in the winter, he was so cold, he thought for sure he would freeze to death. And in the summer, why there's nothing worse than war in the summertime. It stinks so. And the only thing that made Litmus forget that he was hungry and itchy and hot or cold was that he was getting shot at. And he got shot at quite a bit. And he was nothing more than a child. Did he get killed? I asked Miss Franny. Good grief, said Amanda. She rolled her eyes. Now Opal, Miss Franny said, I wouldn't be standing in this room telling the story if he was killed. I wouldn't exist, no ma'am. I had to live, he had to live, and, but he was a changed man. Yes, ma'am, a changed man. He walked back home when the war was over. He walked from Virginia all the way back to Georgia. He didn't have a horse. Nobody had a horse except for the Yankees. He walked and when he got home, there was no one home there. Where was it? I asked her. I didn't care if Amanda thought I was stupid. I wanted to know. 
Why, Miss Franny shouted so loud that when Dixie and Amanda Wilkinson and me all jumped. The Yankees burned it. Yes, ma'am, burned it to the ground. What about his sisters? Amanda asked. She moved around the desk and came and sat on the floor. She looked up at Miss Franny. What happened to them? Dead, dead of typhoid fever. Oh no, Amanda said in a real soft voice. And his mama, I whispered, dead too. And his father, Amanda asked, what happened to him? He died on the battlefield. Litmus was an orphan, I asked. Yes, ma'am, said Miss Franny Block. Litmus was an orphan. This is a real sad story, I told Franny. Sure is, said Amanda. I was amazed that she was agreeing with me about something. I am not done yet, Miss Franny said, when Dixie started to snore and I nudged him with my foot to try to make him quit. I wanted to hear the rest of the story. It was real important to me that I hear how Litmus survived after losing everything he loved. Chapter 17. Well, Litmus came home from the war, said Miss Franny, as she went on with her story and found himself alone. And he sat down on what used to be the front step of his house and he cried and cried. He cried just like a baby. He missed his mama and he missed his daddy and he missed his sisters and he missed the boy he used to be. When he finally finished crying, he had the strangest sensation. He felt like he wanted something sweet. He wanted a piece of candy. He hadn't had a piece of candy in years. And it was right then that he made a decision. Yes, man, Litmus W. Block figured the world was a sorry affair and that it, it had enough ugly things in it. And what he was going to do was concentrate on putting something sweet in it. He got up and he started walking. He walked all the way to Florida. And the whole time he was walking, he was planning. Planning what, I asked. Why, planning the candy factory. Did he build it, I asked. Of course he did. It's still standing out on Fairville Road. That old building, said Amanda, that big spooky one, it's not spooky, said Miss Franny. It was the birthplace of my family fortune. It was there that my great-grandfather manufactured the Litmus lozenge, a candy that was famous around the world. I've never heard of it, said Amanda. Me either, I said. Well, said Miss Franny, they aren't made anymore. The world, it seems, lost its appetite for litmus lozenges, but I still happen to have a few. She opened the top drawer of her desk. It was full of candy. Would you care for a litmus lozenge? She asked Amanda and me. Yes, please, said Amanda. Sure, I said. Can Win Dixie have one too? I have never known a dog that cared for hard candy, said Miss Franny but he is welcome to try one. Miss Franny gave Amanda one litmus lodge, lozenge. Ugh. Miss Franny gave Amanda one litmus lozenge and me two. I unwrapped one and held it out to Win Dixie. He sat up and sniffed it and wagged his tail and took the candy from between my fingers real gentle. He tried to chew on it, and when that didn't work, he just swallowed the whole thing up in one big gulp. <clears throat> then he wagged his tail at me and lay back down. I ate my litmus lozenge slow. It tasted good. It tasted like root beer and strawberry and something else. I didn't have a name for it, something that made me feel kind of sad. I looked over at Amanda. She was sucking on her candy and thinking hard. Do you like it? Miss Franny asked me. Yes, ma'am, I told her. What about you, Amanda? Do you like the litmus lozenge? 
Yes, ma'am, she said, but it makes me think of things I feel sad about. I wonder what in the world Amanda Wilkinson had to feel sad about. She wasn't new in town. She had a mama and a daddy. I had seen her with them at church. There's a secret ingredient in there, Miss Franny said. I know it, I told her. I can taste it. What is it? Sorrow, Miss Franny said. Not everybody can taste it. Children especially seem to have a hard time knowing it's there. I taste it, I said. Me too, said Amanda. Well then, Miss Franny said, you've probably both had your share of sadness. I had to move away from Watley and leave all my friends, I said. That is one sadness I had. And Dunlap and Stevie Dewberry are always picking on me. That's another sadness. And the biggest one, the biggest sadness, is that my mama left me when I was still small. And I can hardly remember her. I keep hoping I'll get to meet her and tell her all my stories. It makes me, it makes me miss Carson, said Amanda. She sounded like she was going to cry. I have to go. And she got up and almost ran out of the Herman W. Block Memorial Library. Who's, Car Who's Carson? I asked Miss Franny. She shook her head. Sorrow, she said. It is a sorrow-filled world. But how do you put that in a piece of candy? I asked her. How do you get the taste in there? That's the secret, she said. That's why Litmus made a fortune. He manufactured a piece of candy that tasted sweet and sad at the same time. Can I have a piece to take to my friend Gloria Dump and another one to take to Otis? Down at Gertrude's Pets and one for the preacher and one for Sweetie Pie too? You may have as many as you want, said Miss Franny. So I stuffed my pockets full of litmus lozenges and I thanked Miss Franny for her story and I checked out Gone with the Wind, which was a very big book. And I told Winn-Dixie to get up and the two of us left and went over to Gloria Dumps. I rode right past the Dewberry's house. Dunlap and Stevie were playing football in the front yard and I was just getting ready to stick my tongue out at them. But then I thought about what Miss Franny said about war being hell. And I thought about what Gloria Dump said about not judging them too hard. And so I just waved instead. They stood and stared at me. But when I, when I was almost all the way past, I saw Dunlap put his hand up in the air and wave back. Hey, he hollered, hey Opal. I waved harder and I thought about Amanda Wilkinson and how it was neat that she liked a good story the same way I did. And I wondered again, who was Carson? I have heard it mentioned a time or two, said Gloria, nodding her head and sucking on the litmus lozenge. It's going to take us a long time to read this book, I told her. There are 1,037 pages. Woo-wee, said Gloria. She leaned back in her chair and crossed her legs on her stomach. Crossed her legs, crossed her hands on her stomach. We best get started then. And so I read the first chapter of Gone with the Wind out loud to Gloria Dump. I read it loud enough to keep her ghosts away. And Gloria listened to it good. And when I was done, she said it was the best surprise she had ever had and she couldn't wait to hear chapter two. That night, I gave the preacher his litmus lozenge right before he kissed me goodnight. What's this, he said. It's some candy that Miss Franny's great grandfather invented. It's called a litmus lozenge. The preacher unwrapped it and put it in his mouth. And after a minute, he started rubbing his nose and nodding his head. Do you like it? I asked him. It has a peculiar flavor. Root beer, I said. Something else. Strawberry? That too, but there's still something else. 
It's odd. I could see that the preacher getting further and further away. He was hunching up his shoulders and lowering his chin and getting ready to pull his head inside his shell. It almost tastes like melancholy. He said, melancholy, what's that? Sad, said the preacher. He rubbed his nose some more. Makes me think of your mother. When Dixie sniffed at the candy wrapper in the preacher's hand. It tastes sad, he said, and sighed. Hmm, must be a bad batch. No, I told him, I sat up in bed. That's the way it's supposed to taste. Litmus came back from the war and his whole family was dead. His daddy died fighting and his mom and his sisters died from a disease and the Yankees burned his house down. And Litmus was sad, very sad. And what he wanted more than anything in the world was something sweet. So he built a candy factory and made Litmus lozenges and he put all the sad he was feeling into the candy. My goodness, said the preacher when Dixie snuffed the candy wrapper out of the preacher's hand and started chewing it. Give me that, I said to Win Dixie, but he wouldn't give it up. I had to reach inside his mouth and pull it out. You can't eat candy wrappers, I told him. The preacher cleared his throat. <clears throat> I thought he was going to say something important, maybe tell me another thing that he remembered about my mama. But what he said was, Opal, I had a talk with Mrs. Dewberry the other day. She said that Stevie says that you're calling him a bald-headed baby. It's true, I said. I did. But he calls Gloria Dump a witch all the time. And he calls Otis retarded. And once he even said that his mama should, said that I shouldn't spend all that time with the old ladies. That's what he said. I think you should apologize, said the preacher. Me, I said. Yes, he said, you. You tell Stevie you're sorry if you said anything that hurt his feelings. I'm sure he just wants to be your friend. I don't think so, I told him. I don't think he wants to be my friend. Some people have a strange way of going about making friends, he said. You apologize. Yes, sir, I said. Then I remembered Carson. Daddy, I said, do you know anything about Amanda Wilkinson? What kind of thing? Do you know something about her and somebody named Carson? Carson was her brother. He drowned last year. He's dead? Yes, said the preacher. His family is still suffering a great deal. How old was he? Five, said the preacher. He was only five years old. Daddy, I said, how could you not tell me about something like that? Other people's tragedies should not be the subject of idle conversation. There was no reason for me to tell you. It's just that I needed to know, I said, because it helps explain Amanda. No wonder she's so pinched faced. What's that? The preacher said. Nothing, I said. Good night, India Opal, the preacher said. He leaned over and kissed me, and I smelled the root beer and strawberry and the sadness, all mixed together in his breath. He patted Win Dixie on the head and got up and turned off the light and closed the door. I didn't go to sleep right away. I lay there and thought how life was like a litmus lozenge, how the sweet and the sad were all mixed up together and how hard it was to separate them out. It was confusing. Daddy, I shouted. After a minute, he opened the door and raised his eyebrows at me. What was that word you said? That word that meant sad? Melancholy, he said. Melancholy, I repeated. I liked the way it sounded, like there was music behind somewhere inside of it. Good night now, said the preacher. Good night, I told him back. I got up out of bed and unwrapped a litmus lozenge and sucked on it hard and thought about my mama leaving. That was a melancholy feeling. And then I thought about Amanda and Carson and that made me feel melancholy too. Poor Amanda and poor Carson. He was the same age as Sweetie Pie, but he would never get to have his sixth birthday party. That's the end of chapter 18. Chapter 19. 
In the morning, me and Win Dixie went down to sweep the pet store, and I took a litmus lozenge for Otis. Is it Halloween? Otis asked when I handed him the candy. No, I said. Why? Well, you're giving me candy. It's just a gift, I told him, for today. Oh, Otis said. He unwrapped the litmus, litmus lozenge and put it in his mouth. And after a minute, tears started rolling down his face. Thank you, he said. Do you like it? I asked him. He nodded his head. It tastes good, but it also tastes a little bit like being in jail. Gertrude, Gertrude squawked. She picked up the litmus lozenge wrapper in her beak and then dropped it and looked around. Gertrude, she screamed again. You can't have any, I told her. It's not for birds. Then real quick, before I lose, lost my nerve, I said, Otis, what was it like in jail? Are you a murderer? That's not what she said, sorry, let me reread that. Otis, what were you in jail for? Are you a murderer? No, ma'am, he said. Are you a burglar? No, ma'am, Otis said again. He sucked on his candy and stared down at his pointy-toed boots. You don't have to tell me, I said. I, I was just wondering. I ain't a dangerous man, Otis said, if that's what you're thinking. I'm lonely, but I ain't dangerous. Okay, I said, and I went back into the back room to get my broom. When I came back out, Otis was standing there where I left him, still staring down at his feet. It was on account of the music, he said. What was? I asked why I went to jail. It was on account of the music. What happened? I wouldn't stop playing my guitar. Used to be I played it on the street and sometimes people would give me money. I, I didn't do it for the money. I did it because the music is better if someone is listening to it. Anyway, the police came and they told me to stop they said how I was breaking the law, and the whole time they were talking to me, I went right on playing my music. And that made them mad. They tried to put handcuffs on me. He sighed. I didn't like that. I wouldn't have been able to play my guitar with them things on. And then what happened? I asked him. I hit them, he whispered. You hit the police? Uh-huh. One of them, I knocked him out. Then I went to jail and they locked me up and wouldn't let me have my guitar. And when they finally let me out, they made me a promise. I would never play my guitar in the street again. He looked up at me real quick and then he backed down at his boots. And I don't, I only play it here for the animals. Gertrude the human Gertrude, she owns the shop and she gave me this job when she read about me in the paper and she said it's all right for me to play music to the animals. You play your music for me and when Dixie and Sweetie Pie, I said. Yeah, he agreed, uh, but you ain't on the street. Thank you for telling me about it, Otis, I said. It's all right, he said, I, I don't mind. Sweetie Pie came in and I gave her a litmus lozenge and she spit it out, right out. And she said that it tasted bad. She said that it tasted like not having a dog. I swept the floor real slow that day. I wanted to keep Otis company. I didn't want him to be lonely. Sometimes it seemed like everybody in the world was lonely. I thought about my mama. Thinking about her was the same as the hole you keep Thinking about her was the same as the hole you keep on feeling with your tongue after you lose a tooth. Time after time, my mind kept going to that empty spot, the spot where I felt like she should be. End of chapter 19.